Twin Jades of Jiangdong. Chapter 7 So So. With that, Zhou Yu fixed his attire and went over to the seat adjacent to Chiao Mao to accompany him for a drink and conversation. Chiao Mao asked Zhou Yu only about his family matters, and Zhou Yu answered those questions one after another without concealing anything. Among these questions, Chiao Mao tested him a few times on the current political state. Zhou Yu answered based on his own thoughts, his replies comprehensive yet concise. The elder and the youth chatted late into the night, and it was only then that Zhou Yu realized Chiao Mao was actually facing a matter of life and death. Three months ago, Chiao Mao had forged an imperial edict to gather all of the feudal marquises and kings and charged Dong Zhou with eleven counts of offenses. The message was delivered overnight by a messenger to Yuan Shao, and the group of feudal marquises and kings then formed the coalition against Dong. Whether the imperial edict was actually issued by Emperor Xian was not important. The only thing that was needed in the beginning was simply a mere justification for this action. Once the intelligence from the Allied army reached Luoyang, every person gritted their teeth in rage at Dong Zhou. Their hatred for him had already existed for a long time, the reason being that after Dong Zhou entered the capital, he allowed the Liang Zhou army to ransack the city while he seized complete control, hiding the truth from the masses with the power in his hand. Yuan Shao thus faced no resistance with his actions, and people were overjoyed by the news of the approaching army. From then on, every one of Luoyang's elites and general populace, without exception, eagerly waited for Yuan Shao to quickly enter the city, rescue the Son of Heaven, and expel the Liang Zhou forces. However, Yuan Shao's allied forces stopped a hundred li outside the capital instead and remained there for more than a month. They sent a secret envoy to Chiao Mao, explaining that not everyone had arrived yet, and that they must wait for the various marquises and kings to gather before sending their forces to storm Luoyang. With this constant back and forth, and because Dong Zhou had long since grown suspicious, he began to conduct rigorous investigations of the city, fearing that the officials of the court were secretly communicating with Yuan Shao. Chiao Mao was an unyielding person, so naturally he became the first subject of investigation. With that, Chiao Mao arrived home. He knew that he wouldn't be able to wait for Yuan Shao to arrive, as he himself might be the first person to be killed by Dong Zhou as a sacrificial offering, so he dismissed his servants and stayed at home awaiting his death. The entirety of Luoyang was sealed off, so Yuan Shao could no longer send secret envoys into the city. But because of that, the minute clues that Dong Zhou wanted to follow were cut off, so he had no choice but to let Jiao Mao dangle between life and death. There were also many complicated matters that he had to deal with, so this issue with Jiao Mao was temporarily pushed aside, he wouldn't go looking for trouble with him at this time. Jiao Mao talked for more than half the night, and although his words were self-deprecating, they made Zhou Yu's heart ache. This old man had placed all of his hopes on Yuan Shao, so why was he taking so long to arrive? Naturally, it was because the Allied coalition was not in agreement with each other, leading to many disputes amongst themselves. Scared yet? Chiao Mao asked tipsily. If you're scared, then it's not too late to go hide in the minister of the masses's household tonight. Zhou Yu turned down the offer with a smile and took a sip of wine, his mind preoccupied with thoughts on how to get in contact with Sun Sa. Chiao Mao kept drinking and drinking, even drinking more than he could handle, to the point where his head thunked onto the table, completely drunk. That night, Zhou Yu headed straight to the guest room to rest, a detailed plan gradually forming in his mind. Zhou Yu pulled out the white falcon from the bundle he carried on him. That falcon was small in size. It had been trapped for many days on the road, a strip of cloth wrapped around its beak, tied with a bow. Zhou Yu stroked its feathers and softly spoke a few words to it. The white falcon turned its head, looked at Zhou Yu, and then looked around at its surroundings. It then leaped out through the window sill, spread its wings in flight, and disappeared into the darkness of the night. That day, after Fi Yu left, it vanished entirely. Zhou Yu suspected that it might not have been able to find Sun Sa, 
who was stationed with his troops outside Hulao Pass, and perhaps had flown back to Changsha instead. In any case, being able to leave was a good thing, with the current dangerous situation Luoyang was in, only birds could fly in and out of the city. For many days, Zhou Yu had been doing his best to try and ask around for more information, but there was no news at all. Soon, rumors of unrest slowly seeped out from inside the palace. Some said that Dong Zhou was preparing to thoroughly pillage the households of Luoyang's government officials and rob the rich families, which was why only entry was allowed into the capital at this time. The entirety of the city of Luoyang became tense overnight, as all sorts of rumors spread like wildfire. That day, when Zhou Yu went to the market, he was finally able to obtain a minute clue about the silk caravans from Jiangnan. Someone said that they had indeed seen the silk merchants from Jiangnan in the western market of Luoyang, and when Zhou Yu asked again along these lines, he found that that was indeed the case. Some months ago, upon hearing that the trade routes to the west were experiencing unrest, the leader of the silk merchants wanted to finish selling all their silks in Luoyang so they could head south and return to Shu County as soon as possible. However, none of them had expected that Luoyang was also in turmoil. No one was willing to buy their goods, so they had no choice but to leave Salai and continue westward. In order to catch up to them however, Zhou Yu would have to cross many checkpoints. Without any connections, it was difficult for him to take even a single step, so Zhou Yu had no alternative but to request documents for travel. When did they leave? Wang Yun asked pensively, leaning his body toward Zhou Yu. According to what they said, it was on the third day of last month, Zhou Yu replied. They took the route through the eight passes of the Taehang Mountains. Then they should have already left the Hang Pass, Wang Yun replied. Zhou Yu then asked, Lord Minister of the Masses, is it possible to get in contact with the garrison stationed there? I came here today only to request a personal letter from the Minister of the Masses himself, and I will always remember the Lord Minister's benevolence. As for the remaining matters, this junior wouldn't dare to inconvenience you any further. This is as easy as lifting one's hand, why should there be a need for thanks? Wang Yun smiled, continuing happily, who knows how long these old bones of mine will live, to be able to write you a personal letter and save a few people only requires a little bit of effort. Bring the ink over. A servant came forward, bringing over a brush and ink. Zhou Yu's heart filled with gratitude, so much so that he didn't notice a servant girl glance at him a couple of times too often. Zhou Yu continued to calculate in his mind. Now that he had obtained Wang Jun's personal letter, the next step was how he was going to leave, and how he was going to find his way out. As Zhou Yu was doing so, he accidentally caught a glimpse of a woman's dazzling appearance, but though he looked at her a few more times, he felt nothing in his heart. It was as if he was simply admiring a flower or a fine painting for a short moment. This is this old man's adopted daughter, Diao Chan, Wang Yu introduced. Please forgive me for my lack of manners. Zhou Yu realized he was being a little rude, and he hurried to apologize to the woman. Diao Chan smiled lightly and knelt down by the seat, rolling up her sleeves and pinning them at the sides as she began to grind ink for Wang Yun. She said in a quiet voice, though Zhou Gongzi has obtained his letter, how do you plan on leaving the city? Grand Preceptor Dong will not let you leave. At that moment, an object came flapping in, crashing into the hall. Fi Yu. Zhou Yu immediately caught the white falcon that had come flying in, he hadn't expected that it would even manage to find this place. There was a small cloth strip tied to Fi Yu's leg that appeared to have words on it. Zhou Yu couldn't take a closer look as he put away the white falcon. Wang Yun was also tactful and didn't ask any questions, instead merely sealing the letter after he finished writing it. Diao Chan proceeded to take it, and the father and daughter pair exchanged a meaningful glance with each other, coming to a tacit understanding. Zhou Yu's heart was heavy as he walked out into the courtyard. He unfolded the cloth strip that Fi Yu had brought back, only to see that on it was a message written in blood. Xiandi, you must not enter Luoyang. If you are already in Luoyang, 
then be sure to seek refuge with Lu Bu, Lu Fengxian. In three days, with the battle drums as the signal, wait for me to enter the city to search for you. Be careful. Xiong Bafu. Zhou Yu's eyebrows furrowed, unsure of the meaning behind Sun Saga's message. If it wasn't for the familiar handwriting, Zhou Yu would have immediately thought that this letter had been intercepted and set up as a trap, only waiting for him to fall into it. A voice rang out from behind him. Zhou Gongzi. Zhou Yu immediately stowed the cloth away. He turned around, bowed, and said, Wang Guniang. Diokin's expression was calm and composed as she said quietly, My father asked me to send Gongzi off. Zhou Yu immediately understood the meaning behind her words. He knew that Wang Yun's house was definitely under surveillance, and with eyes and ears everywhere, having Diao Chan see him off and exchange a few words was less likely to rouse suspicion. I heard that Zhou Gongzi is from Jiangzuo. Diao Chan asked, smiling. It is not obvious at all. Although Zhou Yu was born in Shu County, his build was tall and sturdy, and he was 8 chi in height. His features were completely devoid of the appearance of the southern people, but his handsome yet gentle facial features and the lines of his body gave away his true origins as a southerner. Ever since my grandfather's generation, Zhou Yu replied, my family has resided in Shu County. However, according to the records of our family lineage, during the Warring States period, our ancestors actually lived in the north. Diao Chan nodded her head, asking, I heard my adoptive father say that Zhou Gongzi was originally from a family of medical practitioners. You overestimate me, he replied. My late father had some skill in acupuncture, but after he entered the court, he no longer saw or treated patients. When he taught me his skills, most of the techniques were already lost to time. Letting out an N, Diao Chan said, my adoptive father often speaks of the years when he and Uncle Joe served as imperial officials together, he always praises his exquisite skills to high heaven. When he suffered from rheumatism, headaches, or the like, it was always Uncle Joe who nursed him back to good health. Zhou Yu hurried to say modestly, Gunyang's praise is too much. Even if it had been the legendary Dr. Hua Tuo, he still wouldn't be able to cure these kinds of diseases caused by the damp and cold. Acupuncture could only temporarily dispel the bad qi caused by the wind. Treating an illness requires prescribing the right medicine to treat the symptoms, and as long as the diagnosis of the disease is correct, the medicine will naturally take effect. However, full recovery varies by the individual. Is there something wrong? Has the Lord Minister recently? Diokin's eyebrows were furrowed slightly, and evidently she had something on her mind. When Zhou Yu saw how burdened with cares she looked, naturally the only thing that came to his mind was the possibility that Wang Yun was not well. However, Diao Chan shook her head lightly, and said smiling, My adoptive father is in good health, but I'm grateful for Zhou Gongzi's concern. Zhou Yu did not understand what else it could have been. Diao Chan seemed to still have something to say, but she changed the topic, saying quietly, Right now, Everyone in Luoyang is in danger, and all the doctors have fled. If Zhou Gongzi is well versed in medicine, I would like to request one thing of Gongzi. There's no harm in speaking freely, Zhou Yu said, finally understanding the meaning behind her words. Diao Chan must have some friend who needed a diagnosis by a doctor, so he cut straight to the point. However, I don't have a medicine chest, nor am I carrying any medicinal herbs with me so I can only do my best. In that moment, Diao Chan revealed an expression of relief, as if a heavy burden had been shed. She said, Gongzi does not need to worry, please follow me. With that, Zhou Yu followed Diao Chan, making a turn through the back flower garden, heading toward a secluded side yard. In an extremely low voice, she said, three days ago, this man entered the palace under the guise of proffering a sword, but was unsuccessful in his attempt to assassinate that Dong traitor, and he escaped from the palace. Now the entirety of Luoyang has been sealed off, and this righteous gentleman is heavily injured. All I ask is that Zhou Gongzi do his best. 
whether he lives or dies is up to the will of the heavens. Zhou Yu originally thought that it would be an ordinary doctor visit, but he hadn't expected that the patient would be the traitor in Dong Zhou's book. Diao Chan and he were two complete strangers who had never met before in their lives, and she relied solely on Zhou Yu's family background in entrusting him with this matter of life and death. If he were to come forth with this secret, Diao Chan and Wang Yun's entire family would definitely die. From this fact alone, he could see how much bravery and courage Diao Chan possessed. As she spoke, Diao Chan pushed the door open. She then whispered, This righteous gentleman has never been a person who likes to talk much, so I hope that Zhou Gongzi will forgive him. Lord Ment, I have invited a doctor over for you. Zhou Yu's mind was uneasy as he pushed open the door. The stench of blood hit him as he came face to face with the person inside. Diao Chao brought over the medicine box, and the three people stood in the room, not saying a single word. Forget it. That person was still drinking wine, but now he set aside his glass and replied, Life and death are dictated by fate, there's no need to go through the extra effort. When Zhou Yu faced that assassin, he saw that his height was less than seven chi. His beard fully covered his cheeks, so it was hard to guess his age, but it was obvious that he was past middle age. He had a pair of penetrating, lively eyes, as if they had the wisdom and vigilance to see through the hearts of men. Half of his face was hidden in the shadow, but his powerful, thick arms were bare, and purplish black blood permeated the bandages that wound around the left side of his chest. That person sat nonchalantly in his seat, his legs spread. One of his hands was draped over his knee while the other was holding a pitcher as he poured out drinks for himself to enjoy. Although Zhou Yu had not achieved the state of having read countless people, he was still able to distinguish one's personality from their appearance. This person definitely possessed a rugged temperament, and his heroism reached even the heavens above. He dared to enter the palace on his own to assassinate Dong Zhou, imitating Jing Kei's magnificent example of attempting to kill the Qin Emperor. Zhou Yu couldn't help but respect him. This junior's name is Zhou Yu, courtesy name Gong Jin. So so. This old Sao is only older than you by several years, so you can just call me Men Xiong, that strong man said easily. Are you Zhou Yi's descendant? As he spoke, he appraised Zhou Yu with his eyes. Zhou Yu replied, that is correct. When their eyes meet, it was as if they were looking at each other across the span of a thousand years and ten thousand Qing of territory. In this moment, Zhou Yu couldn't help but feel admiration for this person in his heart. However, he could never have imagined that one day in the future, when the fresh blood from the Battle of Qi Bi dyed the Great River Red and raging fires set aflame even heaven and earth, that he and this person would stand across from each other, once again exchanging a gaze filled with a multitude of emotions in this grand battlefield flooded with so much blood that a shield would float on it. It was as if all those endless months and years and those lofty aspirations to conquer the world were condensed into that one single exchange. Quick, Dian Chao said in a low voice. Zhou Gongzi, I will have to trouble you. Zhou Yu came back to his senses, and he approached So Sa to examine his injuries. Most of his injuries were superficial wounds, except for the arrowhead that had burrowed into his body. It had been embedded deeply under the ribs, narrowly missing the lungs by just a few centimeters. Zhou Yu undid So Sa's bandages and poured the wine over his wounds. So Sa was indeed resilient, and he laid down on the bed unmoving. Zhou Yu then handed him the wine, and So Sa drank it as he waited for Zhou Yu to pull out the arrow. Your father has already passed. So Sa asked. Yes, Zhou Yu said mildly. Three years ago. So Sa drank, only caring about giving himself more wine, as he asked, are you planning to enter the capital to become an official? With the way the world is right now, it won't be an easy path to walk. Zhou Yu's fingers reached into Sao Sao's wound, and his hands were covered with blood as he replied, I came to the capital to examine the situation, but I have no wish to repeat the path my late father walked. The morals of this world are degrading with each passing day, and the hearts of the people are slipping out of its grasp, 
so Sa pensively said. Let me give you a word of advice, do not stay in the capital for long. So Sa then proceeded to grit his teeth and let out a muffled grunt as Zhou Yu pulled out the arrowhead. Fresh blood spurted out wildly, and Zhou Yu immediately staunched the bleeding with a cloth, his hands covered in blood. Diao Chan placed a bottle of Jinchuang medicine into his hand. When people live in such troubled times, they do not have the right to live solely for themselves, Zhou Yu replied indifferently. If I could leave, I would have left long ago. Hasn't Lord So also stayed behind? So Sa couldn't stop panting, his face as white as a sheet as Zhou Yu speedily applied the Jinchuang medicine. At that very moment, from the outside came the commotion of soldiers. Lord Wang, if I could trouble you to stand aside. Zhou Yu instantly grew alert, and he turned an inquiring gaze on Diao Chan. Diao Chan motioned for him to remain calm as she said, I will go deal with this matter. Diao Chan pushed the door open, leisurely walking out before closing it behind her. She walked out into the corridor, only to see Wang Yun standing in the middle of the courtyard, angrily saying, You all, the audacity of you all. We apologize for the offense, Lord Wang. A military general walked in lazily, wearing a brocade robe embroidered with a black kylan, a martial headpiece crowning his head. Like a jade tree in the wind, he possessed a graceful demeanor. He had deep-set eyes and dark eyebrows that spread out like an eagle spreading its wings, with pitch-black pupils that had a few flecks of amber like gold. When he stood there, he stuck out from the rest like a crane in a flock of chickens, a whole head taller than the rest of his subordinates. This humble official had no other choice as well, that Marshal General explained. Grand Preceptor Dong ordered that we must find the assassin today. General Lu, Wang Yun said coldly, both of his hands resting on the cane planted in the ground in front of him. Could it be that the Marquis of May still suspects that I'm harboring assassins? It seems like the Lord Minister of the Masses is not aware, Lu Bu replied. Three days ago, there was an assassin who, under the guise of proffering a sword, managed to wound Grand Preceptor Dong. We received news that as of now, this assassin is still in the city, so pardon our intrusion. Search. Wang Yun's expression changed slightly. Lu Bu's subordinates had scattered across the residence and began to conduct a search. Lu Bu nodded at Wang Yun, he had no intention of talking to him anymore and walked on his own into the corridor. At this time, Diao Chan walked out of the corridor, and the two of them almost crashed into each other. Lu Bu subconsciously reached out his hand and steadied her. Diokin's flower-like face lost its color as she bowed, Greetings, General. When Diao Chan lifted her head, she made eye contact with Lu Bu, and the both of them fell silent. Wang Yun was following behind Lu Bu, and upon seeing the scene before him, he said, this is my daughter Diao Chan. Diao Chan, why haven't you apologized to the general yet? Pardon me, Diao Chan said softly. It's, it's all right. A self-conscious expression flashed across Lu Bu's cold, composed face for a split second, but within the span of a few breaths, he managed to conceal his own awkwardness. Why don't I let my daughter accompany the general to take a look inside? That crafty old fox Wang Yun immediately piped up, even as he sent a meaningful glance at Diao Chen. That's also fine, Lu Bu said coldly. Then you lead the way, let's go. Diao Chen bowed again, before she proceeded to lead Lu Bu through the corridor to the side chambers. As Lu Bu walked behind Diao Chen, he openly scanned her from head to toe. For a moment he wanted to say something, but he wasn't sure how to strike up a conversation. Unexpectedly, Diao Chan abruptly stopped in front of him, and Lu Bu was unable to stop in time, almost bumping into her again. Diao Chan turned around and said, General, this is my room. I don't know if... Lu Bu waved his hand and responded, Forget it. Let's go to the side courtyard. Diao Chan led Lu Bu through the arched doorway and towards the back courtyard. The two of them stood by the pool as the autumn breeze blew past, the pond's surface covered with fallen leaves. 
there was an old servant sweeping the floor outside the doors. It's only this big, Diao Chan said. This is the study. Would the general like to go inside and take a look? The soldiers wanted to enter, but after catching a glimpse of Lu Bu in the back courtyard, they no longer came in to conduct their search. Lu Bu ordered one of his subordinates, give the order not to search the lady's personal room. That person outside the door responded in the affirmative. Diokin's heart pounded wildly, and when she turned her head, she noticed that Lu Bu was watching her attentively. What are you nervous about? Lu Bu asked indifferently, looking at Diokin's face. Diao Chan did not reply as she walked to the edge of the pond. Lu Bu stood behind her as she gazed at autumn waters filling the pool. I would like to ask you one thing, Lu Bu said. Has So Sa come here, just tell me the truth. Diao Chan replied, what does the general mean by this? No such thing has happened. The corners of Lu Bu's mouth curled up slightly as he looked toward the door of the side courtyard. A hand reached out from the window sill of the room, and it cleanly and swiftly flashed to the edge of the window. No. Lu Bu asked in response, before he turned and, taking big steps, leaped up onto the railings of the corridor. He jumped down and landed in front of the door, pushing it open. Inside, the room was completely empty, and the window overlooked the stables in front of the back door. The autumn breeze gusted through the hall, and there was still the faint scent of blood lingering in the air. Lu Bu stood in front of the window, while underneath the window sill hit Zhou Yu, his hands still covered in blood, and So Sa, who was leaning against the foot of the wall, drinking wine. The corners of Sao Sa's lips curled up slightly as he gave Zhou Yu a big thumbs up, signaling that he had done a good job. Lu Bu lowered his head to look at the window sill. He swiped his finger across it, only to find that there was not a single trace of dust on it. Diao Chan entered behind him. Lu Bu turned his head and gazed at her attentively. After a moment, without saying anything, he walked past her. Diao Chan hurried to say, General, my father would like to invite the general to stay and drink a cup of wine. Lu Bu gave her a side glance, seemingly wanting to leave. However, a short moment later, he accepted Diokin's invitation, and said indifferently, then lay out the wine ba. At the same time, Zhou Yu and So Sa staggered out, bedraggled. Both of them let out a long breath. I must leave the capital as quickly as possible, So Sa said in a quiet voice. You still have to rest for a few days, Zhou Yu replied. If you leave in your current condition, it won't be long before you fall into the enemy's hands. Then you leave with me, So Sa said. To go see you and Xiao. As Zhou Yu observed his surroundings, his heart leapt at that. If he could successfully get to Yu and Xiao's allied troops, then he would be able to see Sun Sa. Come, follow me. After making sure that there were no hidden sentry posts nearby, Zhou Yu led So Sa to Chiao Mao's residence. Yu and Xiao is incompetent at strategizing, So Sa said. I must first return to Suzhu and meet with Tao Qian. Zhou Yu did not answer. So Sa continued, You look like you have guts, and are in possession of a meticulous mind. Nor are you a person prone to passivity, because you carry a sword at your waist, which shows that you have enough martial arts skills to protect yourself. With you accompanying me on the journey, our security can be guaranteed. After pondering for a moment, Zhou Yu shook his head and said, I have not yet finished dealing with my matters, so I have no way to protect Lord Sao on this journey. Please forgive me. So Sa smiled faintly and didn't force the issue. He merely said, This is Governor Jiao Mao's residence. I was just about to go and find him. Zhou Yu nodded and led So Sa to the outside of Jiao Mao's hall. He pushed the door open, letting So Sa walk in, causing Jiao Mao to immediately turn pale with shock. From the outside, Zhou Yu then closed the door, leaving the two of them inside the hall to speak. He pressed his hand to the hilt of his sword, standing guard outside in case there was any trouble. A few moments later, he heard loud laughter from Sao Sao and Jiao Mao, 
and he knew that there were no more problems. With that, he finally felt reassured, and he left. That night, So Sa took up temporary residence in Chiao Mao's estate, and he drank with Chiao Mao until late into the night. Meanwhile, Zhou Yu tossed and turned on his bed, constantly thinking about that letter of Sun Sa's. What did it mean to go seek out Lu Bu? Could Lu Bu be on their side? He didn't dare to rashly side himself with Lu Bu, so he called over the White Falcon Fiyu and penned another letter, asking Sun Sa for more details. He then let the falcon fly away. Judging from the direction the bird flew, he estimated that it was heading towards the general region around the Hulao Pass. End chapter. Twin Jades of Zhangdong. Chapter 8. Reunion. A few days later, the whole city was in a state of panic. Chiao Miao received word that Dong Zhou's subordinates Li Zhu and Guo Si had encountered a joint attack from a group of warlords at Hulao Pass and fled in defeat. In no more than a few days' time, Yuan Shao was threatening to storm Luyang and take Dong Zhou's head as a sacrificial offering for victory. The entirety of Luyang grew tense as Lu Bu sealed off all city gates and strictly prohibited all entry and exit. That day, Zhou Yu was at a shop in Luyang buying rice noodles for Chiao Mao, when suddenly a servant girl hurriedly approached him and slipped a small note into his hand. While no one was watching, Zhou Yu unfolded the note to take a look and was immediately shocked. Dong Zhou is relocating the capital. Governor Chiao's name is not on the name list. Hurry and flee. Seeing that the handwriting was quite graceful, it was most likely written by Diao Chen. He did not know where she obtained this information, perhaps it had come from Lu Bu. Zhou Yu pondered for a moment Dong Zhou was relocating the capital, so the entire court and all the government officials would have to follow him. What was the implication then of leaving Chiao Miao behind? Wasn't it because Dong Zhou no longer intended to let Chiao Miao live? Zhou Yu immediately abandoned what he was doing and ran all the way back to the Chiao residence. While still panting for breath, he pushed open the door, only to see Chiao Mao talking with another middle-aged man inside the hall. You must leave Luyang immediately, Zhou Yu said. Minister Wang has received the news. It is very likely Dong Zhou wants to harm Governor Chiao. Then let him come. Chiao Miao's temper was explosive, and at this, he slapped his hand against the table, sending the cups and plates rattling. Zhou Yu placed his hand on his sword and took a step forward. His tall stature blocked off the daylight streaming in from outside, like an unyielding mountain. Please listen to me. Zhou Yu said gravely. Why does Governor Chiao insist on keeping watch over this place? Only by first ensuring your survival now can you contend against Dong Zhou in the future. Chiao Miao looked at Zhou Yu, before he suddenly burst out into loud laughter, shaking his head helplessly. Young man, Chiao Miao said with amusement, this old man has lived for so many years that even death cannot scare me. Why should I fear a mere traitor to the nation? It's precisely because you don't fear death, Zhou Yu replied, then why must you fear living? Second uncle, the middle-aged man said, nephew Zhou is right. What's the use of you staying here? Chiao Miao then answered, this old man has already finished what he has set out to do, which was to pass on the imperial edict to all the dukes and marquises. That Dong trader's time has passed. This world is left in the hands of you youngsters now. Chiao Miao thoughtfully sipped a mouthful of wine. Under the light of the oil lamp, he seemed to have aged significantly. Zhou Yu took a deep breath, then let out a long sigh. So Mend has already left. Chiao Miao said, you leave first Ba. Once this old man has finished arranging everything, I will escort you and Chiao Xian out of the city. Zhou Yu wanted to say more, but Chiao Miao already waved for him to leave, saying, Chiao Xian, you send this nephew of mine back to rest. Chiao Xian had no choice but to get up, and he made a if you please gesture, showing Zhou Yu out. Lord Chiao. Zhou Yu said as he stood in the middle of the courtyard. Nephew Zhou, Chiao Xian replied, on your way here from the Jiangnan region, 
Did you hear any news about Wu County? Zhou Yu replied, the Jiangnan region hasn't experienced any unrest, but this. Let's wait until tonight, Jiao Xian said. Perhaps we should think of a way to kidnap my second uncle out of the city. Zhou Yu could only nod his head, and he went back to pack his things. He knew that he could no longer stay in Luoyang, as Dong Zhou's purge of the city was imminent. That night, he kept himself wide awake, waiting for the White Falcon's return, but it never arrived. At midnight, Jiao Xian called him to get up, signaling him to be quiet as he said, Let's go. Zhou Yu slung his satchel over his shoulder and came out. When he passed by the main hall, he saw that Jiao Miao was polishing a long sword, and a waist tally was laying on the table. This is the travel pass that this old man has obtained through my connections, Jiao Miao said. So Mend already took one and left the city last night. You two ride quickly and head along the main road east of the city. You must not come back. Second uncle. Jiao Xian said. Zhou Yu took a step forward with plans to forcefully grab Jiao Miao without leaving any room for protest so that he could bring him along. But, it was just at that moment that soldiers outside began to bang on the main doors, roaring in anger. Open the door. Open the door. Zhou Yu was startled, but Jiao Miao pushed the two of them towards the back door. Zhou Yu protested, don't go outside. Even as he spoke, the front door was kicked open by the soldiers. The troops came swarming in like bees, shouting, No one is allowed to leave. Where are Jiao Mao and Jiao Xian? Zhou Yu realized that there was still Jiao Xian to protect, so he immediately dragged him out to the backyard. Both of their eyes reddened as they listened to the pained cry of a soldier ring out from inside, it was evident that Jiao Mao had already started attacking. Jiao Xian's eyes bulged with rage, and he looked as if he wanted to rush back in to kill them. However, Zhou Yu said, we have to go. Quickly. The two of them mounted their horses. For a while, the sounds of screams filled the air as large fires burned along the streets, flames blazing in all directions. Luoyang had already become submerged in a sea of fire. Across the streets and roofs, arrows flew in all directions, Evidently, Yuan Shao's allied forces had already begun to attack the city. Amidst the chaos, Jiao Xian's warhorse was hit by an arrow, and it collapsed to the ground. With a jolt, Zhou Yu hurried to dismount, letting Jian Xian climb onto his warhorse. The two men rode on the same steed, rushing to the exit of the city, only to find that the eastern gates had become a wall of flame that blanketed everything, leaving them nowhere to escape. Zhou Yu hurriedly spurred on his warhorse, leaping up to the higher ground. Several times, he had to urge it to jump across a collapsed roof, but even the warhorse shrank back in fear. Zhou Yu gasped for breath, and Jiao Xian said, Forget it. Nephew, let me get off the horse. I do not want to drag you down any longer. Zhou Yu was silent for a moment before he dismounted. With a handsome backhanded swing of his sword, he stabbed the horse's rump. The warhorse let out a long whinny and galloped away wildly in pain. Jiao Xian roared, Zhou Gongjin. Have a safe journey. Zhou Yu shouted back. The warhorse, carrying Jiao Xian, dashed to the edge of the roof, before it leapt into the air, flying over the sea of flames, and rushed directly through the east gate. In Zhou Yu's eyes reflected the raging flames that filled the sky. Ashes flew through the air, and in that moment, as the thousand-year-old ancient capital was cremated in that fiery sea, the countless voices weeping and wailing sounded like a hymn to the dynasty. He could not give up yet. Zhou Yu glanced around at his surroundings. He had to survive. If he could find a well or cellar, he could possibly hide there until the fire died out. He ran down the long street, several times barely dodging flaming buildings that suddenly collapsed with a bang. However, the long street had already become a hell filled with grey ash and black smoke. He covered his face with a cloth, coughing frantically as he staggered forward. In front of him was fire, and behind him was also fire. 
as far as he could see, there were only torrents of crimson lotuses reaching for the sky. With a screech, the white falcon swooped down from high above. Cough cough. Fee-eu, Joe you laid among the charred ruins, his hair frazzled from the high temperatures. The white falcon flew down and grabbed his arm. Hurry. Hurry and leave, Joe you waved his hand, trying to send it away. His eyes were bright red, and tears streamed non-stop down his face from the smoke. It felt as if he was going to cough up all his organs. He used what strength he had remaining to rise, only to faintly hear, in the distance, someone shouting his name. Zhou Gongjin. Zhou Yu looked around him, bewildered. Immediately, a warhorse neighed, accompanied by the collapse of a house behind him. Sparks and flames flew everywhere as a tall, sturdy horse leapt through the air and rushed towards the middle of the street. A person leapt off the horse and pressed Zhou Yu to the ground. Cough, cough. Soon Sa took off his helmet, his eyes red, his face covered with ash and dust. Tears flowed from his eyes, which could have been either from the irritation of the smoke, or tears of joy from their reunion after such a long separation. Bafu. Zhou Yu shouted. Bafu. The two hugged each other tightly. Without saying a word, Soon Sa carried Zhou Yu onto his horse and charged into the sea of fire with him. All Zhou Yu could remember that day was the raging flames, the thick smoke and embers, and the scorching heat that burned his eyes. Through a veil of uncontrollable tears, they reined the horse to a stop high up on the city walls, watching the whole city of Luoyang being destroyed like a magnificent sacrificial rite. Under the Hang Pass, the wind carried with it the voices of ghosts, and the setting sun was a scarlet red like the color of blood. The withered grass had the fragrance of burnt matter about it, and from afar came the faint sounds of crying. The two ashen-faced, bedraggled youths sat outside a mostly collapsed thatched hut, smoke rising from their campfire. Joe Yu sat on a stone, ravenously devouring dried meat and beans cooked in a clay pot. Be careful not to burn your mouth, soon Sa teased. Joe Yu ignored him, took the water soon Sa had set to one side, and took several big gulps from it. The fresh spring water dripped down from the corners of his mouth. All of the exotic delicacies I have had in my life cannot be compared to your clay pot beans, Bafu, Zhou Yu said after swallowing a mouthful of boiled beans. His hair was unbound and messy, and his expensive brocade robe was extremely filthy. He shook his head and continued, the life of this Zhou Gongjin is yours from now on. Soon Sa let out a loud, hearty laugh, and that handsome face was so sooty it looked as if he had just climbed out of a chimney. Zhou Yu set down the pot, drank another mouthful of water, and wiped his face. He then staggered to the stream to wash his face, while Soon Sa said from afar, You have to sign your name, put your stamp and hand your contract of servitude to me right now. That way, Later on, I can go to your house and demand to your mother to hand you over. Zhou Yu did not respond, he instead squatted down by the stream to wash his face. Soon Sa chuckled as he began to eat the beans with his bare hands. Can't you wash your hands first? Zhou Yu shouted angrily. You nag me even more than my own mother does. You don't like being clean. Zhou Yu said lecturing him seriously as he used a towel to clean Soon Sa's hands. Soon Sa had tickled himself pink with that, and laughed to himself in amusement, my mother often told me to bring a wife back with me, so that she can keep a firm hold over me. The way I see it, there's no need for me to bring back a wife anymore, you'll do. You're even fussier than my mother. Zhou Yu glanced at him casually, refusing to respond to Soon Sa's words. He then went into the hut and laid down, he had been running around for an entire day and night, and now he was truly exhausted. Soon Sa was eating beans outside, watching the sun sink little by little below the horizon, like a devoted hound guarding the house. He muttered to himself, if you're willing to sell your life just like that, how will you thank me later? Zhou Yu. Soon Sa did not speak again. The corners of his mouth curled up into a faint smile as he watched that last bit of dying sun gradually disappear. 
At night, Zhou Yu slept very restlessly. One moment, his dreams were filled with the sea of flames that was Luyang, while the next, they were filled with bitter cries of misery. He woke several times, but he knew that because Sun Sa was at his side and there was no safer place in the world than here, he fell soundly back asleep. Towards the end of the night, Sun Sa's head kept drooping, he was also too sleepy to stay awake. He gave up on keeping watch, crawled into the thatched hut, and fell asleep next to Zhou Yu. Their two heads were pressed close to each other. Because autumn was arriving, the weather was growing chilly. Soon Saga's body was like a heater, naturally emitting heat so Zhou Yu couldn't help but press close to him. They didn't know how long they had slept. The night was still as dark and thick as ink, yet for some unknown reason, both men woke in the middle of that profoundly silent night. Zhou Yu felt Soon Saga's breath hitch first before he let it out in a light exhale. Are you cold? Zhou Yu asked. A little bit, Soon Sa replied. Let's hit the road once it's done. You should sleep a little more. Zhou Yu verbally agreed, but all desire to sleep had disappeared, so he sat up. Soon Sa started a fire, and the two of them warmed their bodies around it. Zhou Yu raised his eyes to look at Soon Sa, only to see that he was smiling again, and his hair had been tied up. In Soon Sa's eyes was reflected the image of Zhou Yu, his upper body bare, revealing his muscular fair chest, mulling over his thoughts as he faced the flames. Where are we going next? Zhou Yu asked. You're going with me. Soon Sa was a little surprised, chuckling as he asked that question. What? Zhou Yu said, puzzled. Of course, I'm going with you, I've already given my life to you. Any complaints? Soon Sa thoughtfully replied, I thought you didn't actually mean it. Zhou Yu did not say anything more. After a moment of contemplation, he asked, How's the battlefield situation right now? Soon Sa thought for a bit, before replying, My father should have already invaded Luoyang by now. There was a look of worry in Zhou Yu's eyes. Soon Sa knew that he was worried about Soon Sa deserting his post to break into Luoyang to save Zhou Yu's life so he motioned for Zhou Yu to look at the white falcon cooing as it squatted on the wall. When will the reinforcements arrive? Zhou Yu asked. After dawn, we will meet up with them under Hang Pass, Soon Sa absent-mindedly said. After that, we'll discuss what to do next. Let's go back to Changsha, Zhou Yu said. Soon Sa raised his eyebrows and looked at Zhou Yu, who replied, being able to escape with this life of mine is blessing enough, I don't want to go find those shipments anymore, I've realized that I was far too naive. Soon Sa laughed but didn't say anything in response. He added a little more firewood to the campfire and changed the subject, earnestly saying, I still haven't thought about what position to appoint you to, yet. I don't even know where I should go from here. Say, Gong Jin. What official post do you think I can achieve in the future? Zhou Yu glanced at Sun Sa and said, Grand Commandant? Great General. As of today, Sun Sa said, Heroes from across the land have risen up in unison, and Dong Zhou has kidnapped the Emperor and fled west. In a few months, we will sink into a turbulent world burning with the flames of battle. Everyone will be loudly proclaiming their allegiance to the Han royals, but in reality, each will be unfaithful like Yuan Shu, Gong Sun Zan, Zhang Miao, Ma Tang, Yuan Shao, Tao Qian, and also my Sun family. When 18 different warlords form a coalition to overthrow Dong Zhou, who do you think can be their leader? Naturally, it will be your Sun household, Zhou Yu said lightly. I'm not joking with you. Sun Sa threw down the branch he had used to stoke the fire and stood up. I know, Zhou Yu said but your words are too treasonous. Soon Sa replied, do not bring his majesty or the Han royal family into this. You say this, but you are well aware of what your father's aspirations were before his passing. Zhou Yu did not reply. He was silent for a long while, so Soon Sa continued, Dong Zhou has forcefully extorted taxes from the people, and his days are numbered. Soon, 
the world will fall into chaos, and at that time, the warlords that have participated in today's battle will form their own factions. At that time, we will see who will become the new emergent power. None of them are suitable, Zhou Yu said. The UN family might be able to do it, Soon Sa said, turning his head to watch Zhou Yu. For generations, the UN family has held positions high in the government, and right now, their voice is the loudest. No, they won't, Zhou Yu insisted. Although these two brothers, Yuan Shu and Yuan Shao, have a great reputation, Yuan Shu is mired in the pleasures of the flesh, and is stubborn and set in his ways. Meanwhile Yuan Shao is indecisive and irresolute. In addition, these brothers of the Yuan family often scheme against each other, so even though they can assume the role of the leader in this alliance, if they want to clean up this mess, they will be unable to convince the masses of such. Soon Sa watched Zhou Yu in silence. Zhou Yu, looking thoughtful, raised his eyes to look at Soon Sa as he said, I predict that in the future, the person who will pick up the pieces and reform the world is most likely not one of these 18. How about my father? Soon Sa asked. Zhou Yu and Soon Sa looked at each other for a moment, before Zhou Yu gently shook his head. Soon Sa let out a sigh. You actually believe whatever I say. Zhou Yu suddenly felt greatly amused. It's because you're smart, Soon Sa said easily. Even though I don't really want to admit it, you are right. If I'm really smart, then I wouldn't be sitting here, Zhou Yu responded lightly. Soon Sa glanced at Zhou Yu out of the corner of his eyes. With a mischievous glint in his eyes, Zhou Yu suddenly spoke again. But I'm happy to do so, that's why I'm here. Your dad won't be able to do it, but you will. Soon Sa laughed but didn't say anything. Zhou Yu, however, said seriously, knock it off, I know what's on your mind. At that moment, it was as if Soon Sa had transformed into a different person. That usual carefree, joyful, somewhat careless attitude disappeared and was replaced with a serious and grave expression. SHH, Soon Sa warned. Let's talk about this matter later, Gong Jin. Before, I didn't let you come to my side, precisely because I was undecided. What about now? Zhou Yu lightly asked. Without waiting for Soon Sa's answer, Zhou Yu began to sketch out the terrain of the surrounding regions on the ground with a tree branch. He motioned for Soon Sa to look as he explained, all of the Marquis's troops are stationed under the Hulao Pass, locked in combat with Dong Zhou. However, despite Luoyang being sealed for several months, from beginning to end no one has been willing to send out troops to block Dong Zhou's way out. At this moment, if they intended to unite under a common cause, the coalition leader Yuan Shao should have led the allied forces forth to besiege the city and attack. Why haven't they come? It's precisely because everyone is hesitating, whoever enters Luoyang first will inevitably seize great power. The fall of Dong Zhou is but a few days away, Zhou Yu said, resigned. The coalition army assembled in the spring, but even now, it is autumn, and not even a single squad has been willing to ambush Dong Zhou along the road to the west that he is retreating along. It's clear that they all harbor the greedy desire to enter the city first. When Zhou Yu got to this point, he realized that he had even counted Sun Saga's father in that group, so he held back what he was going to say next. He merely watched Sun Sa silently, a smile in his eyes. People are inclined to seek their own gain and avoid trouble, Sun Sa said. My father was also not willing to send out troops, but he had no other choice. However, what does what we've talked about have to do with which of the Marquises will be able to take the lead? Of course, there's a connection, Zhou Yu said. Don't play dumb with me. Staying in Hulao Pass and watching Luoyang like a tiger watching its prey, what other purpose is there than for profit? But what benefits are there to gain upon entering the city? Nothing more than mere gold, silver, and other valuables, and the reputation of being the one who expelled the traitor Dong Zhou. And what benefits are there to ambushing Dong Zhou as he flees west? Soon Sa raised his eyebrows, looked at Zhou Yu, puzzled, and said, 
I honestly don't know. Killing Dong Zhou is the biggest benefit, Zhou Yu said. It's a pity that none of the Marquises have realized this yet. It's nothing more than a reason to be rewarded thusly, Soon Sa said thoughtlessly. Zhou Yu, is it only for the reward? Have you forgotten who Dong Zhou escaped with? When he said these words, without needing Zhou Yu to explain any further, Soon Sa already understood. The Emperor, Soon Sa muttered. I hadn't even thought of it earlier. Did you really not think of that? Zhou Yu asked, smiling lightly. Unlikely Ba. Soon Sa replied sincerely, I really didn't think of it, but what you said is right. Dong Zhou has the Emperor in his hands, and though he is young in years, he is still the Son of Heaven. His standing is indisputable and in a chaotic situation like this, whichever Marquis succeeds in saving him, the Emperor will be in his hands. Zhou Yu knew Soon Sa must have thought of it, but why had he not chosen to go rescue the Emperor? Was it only to save Zhou Yu, trapped in Luoyang? But looking at Soon Sa playing dumb, Zhou Yu did not wish to expose him either. No matter what, he felt very flattered, being the recipient of such honor. However, because Soon Sa had given up the most critical matter in order to save him, Zhou Yu had to think of a way to remedy the situation, no matter what. Zhou Yu then said with ease, no one has gone to rescue the emperor, they only want to compete for merit and share the treasures. Based on this, I can confirm that the person who will establish himself in the turbulent world of the future and rise above all other factions will not be one of these 18 Marquises. Unless, there was someone whose first thought was to conduct a rescue, then, only that person will be able to bear the great responsibility, and may even be the one to unite all the lands under the heavens again one day. What a pity, that fellow's friend keeps holding him back all the time, delaying his matters a great deal. Soon Sa began to laugh at that, his chuckles tinged with a soaring, youthful vigor. He said, who are you talking about, huh? You even know that you've delayed quite a few matters of mine. With that, he used a tree branch to poke at Zhou Yu's face. Zhou Yu used the branch in his hand to strike that branch a few times in a playful manner, before he tossed it to one side, saying, I'm not playing around anymore. The battlefield changes rapidly. After all, when Dong Zhou was still in Luoyang, no one would have thought that he would set fire to Luoyang in one fell swoop, before taking away the emperor. But. And as he spoke, Zhou Yu rose and walked out of the house. Under the pitch black sky, he looked toward Soon Sa and narrowed his eyes, as if he was thinking about something. Soon Sa seemed to be considering something as well. If you have a group of soldiers on hand right now, can you ambush Dong Zhou and save the emperor? Zhou Yu asked, very quietly. Soon Sa replied, before sending out the troops, I considered this. I need someone to work with me to feint an attack from the east, instead of striking from the west, to lure the tiger from its mountain. The prerequisite is that. Shifu cannot be in the barracks, but the probability of this is not high. It's too difficult, my father actually didn't approve of letting me come in pursuit. Shifu. Zhou Yu noticed this specific address, but because Sun Sa didn't say anything, Zhou Yu didn't ask any more. Sun Sa looked at Zhou Yu, who raised his eyebrows and asked, not understanding, do you have any other questions? No, Sun Sa revealed a smile, got on his horse, and released Fi Yu. As the sky began to lighten up, the two disappeared at the end of the mountain road. End chapter